advocacy is really important not so much to promote your product as much as it is to remove the deterrents to the growth of your product the roadblocks are in you know can be removed with advocacy you so they you got to do two things so your advertising or your front foot is out there to start creating the need and the advocacy is to kind of take out the obstacles in a way these two together will actually help you overcome the problem sooner or you will keep finding like uh, i've been says you know it's a long painful process and after 3 months there will be another roadblock and after 6 months there will be another roadblock you've got to be able to use these tools of advertising and advocacy to be able to remove the roadblocks so very happy to see the fraternity here i hope you're all in good health and are keeping safe and thank you very much for taking the time out to join in during such a difficult time uh, it's such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone our distinguished panelists who are hand picked because of the think input and the rich experience that they bring in and thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us we've received over 150 registrations most of whom are cxos and senior leaders uh, many of our are members and our repeat visitors to our webinars which is very encouraging and motivates us to provide higher levels of dialogue to the online modes as well for those of you who are new with us today the blue circle is an exclusive community and ecosystem which is curated for business leaders across six sectors which are aerospace and defense e mobility energy healthcare logistics and real estate we also present socio economic insights which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market in response to the covid challenge The Blue Circle has also accentuated its digital presence. One of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series and our digital publication. And in in addition to this, and you'll be happy to know that we very recently launched the first version of the Blue Circle app, curated for leaders, somewhat like the sector-specific LinkedIn for senior leaders, a space that brings them together to have meaningful conversations, connect with each other, and also house high-quality curated content. and also soon we will be we will be adding features for leaders to even exchange business opportunities on the platform so those leaders among you who are interested please do write to us i will also share the link of the app in the chat section and we'll be soon sending out invitations post our webinar uh, our android version has just also gone live today uh, we've also begun our selective outreach for memberships and have close to 3000 leaders who have joined the waitlist for the community app and today as part of our marketing advocacy and customer acquisition series we are privileged to have big minds and thinking leaders in the industry to join our aerospace and defense circles discussion as the geopolitical fault lines are becoming sharper the aerospace and defense market is reenergizing at the same time the sector is becoming more complex as new entrants compete for market share and the aftermarket evolves in this intense environment it's not enough for and companies to follow their old approach when fighting for a bigger piece of the pie they need new strategies and the topic of the discussion today is marketing advocacy and pr strategies to win businesses in india and globally in the best interest of time i will just briefly mention the names and designations of the leaders who joined the panel today we have with us mr arvind mera ed and ceo mahindra aerospace an md and ceo mahindra aerostructures mr mahesh murthy founder and director exceed space mr vivek krishnan ceo sss defense or or a triple s defense and the chair and moderator for the session is mr pavan choudhury who is a board member and an investor in blue circle chairman mti ceo french mnc wygon india is a public intellectual best selling author and is also a leading thinker across sectors uh mr surender vaidya will just be joining us shortly uh, he is the evp and business head of godrej aerospace he is stuck because of rainfall and uh, uh, hence his wifi is has some connecting issues so he'll be just joining in uh, and i now request mr choudhury to please chair and moderate the session sir thank you very much siddharth and uh, what a fine star studded uh, panel and i'm sure that the people who will join in the audience will also be highly informed and we'll have a great dialogue again and um, coming to the topic market marketing and advocacy strategies to win business 
in India and globally for aerospace and defense. Well, arms is an industry which surely is guided by market shares, but also ensures, uh, but also changes the shares of the globe. It restructures the boundaries of the globe often. And though the history of aerospace and defense marketing, defense marketing, let me say, is fuzzy. Why it is fuzzy? Because till the 17th century, the colonial powers had truces among themselves that they will not supply arms to the slave states so that a revolution or mutiny against them can be avoided. They used to do it, but it was illicitly done. So there is no historiography which has happened. And the interest during this space, recording the events which happened during this time is basically of the war enthusiast. So serious histo historiographers were not there, but defense marketing and advertising, let me say, it is an age old practice. Blue Circle has researched real world stuff on marketing and advocacy strategies, which is not easily available. And which aerospace and defense companies and even governments adopt. The role of marketing and advocacy would only increase in the years to come because the markets are also changing. Earlier, there were just five countries which were arms exporters. Now their shares are changing. The, P, the countries who were buying from them are changing. So there is a flux in the market which will give a catalytic <coughs> impact to aerospace defense and marketing. <coughs> aerospace and defense marketing. The word advocacy we use in a morally neutral manner. We only speak of advocacy efforts which are compliant to good governance. To cover the entire gamut of the business and business development in this space, let us look at the whole purchase process. The purchase process stands basically on two legs tendering piece and the marketing and advocacy piece. So this is how I would like to draw the perimeter of the discussion today. I now come to Vivek to tell us his top thoughts on this piece. And if he would like to uh, edit what I have said as far as the perimeter is concerned, Vivek. Thanks so much for the introduction, Bhavan. And I really appreciate the presence of all the people on this particular panel. Uh, it, it's really awesome for me to be as a part of this discussion. Now, uh, before I actually uh, get into the subject in itself, uh, we have Arvind here from Mahindra and Mahindra and uh, Mr. Vendia from uh, Godrej. Uh, both of those people really did uh, no introduction and neither do the companies. And in the middle of all of this, we have a company called Triple S Defense. And the question is, who the heck is Triple S Defense? I mean, it's like a who let the dogs out moment out here. So I thought I'll quickly, you know, give a couple of points. Uh, we uh, are a new age defense venture focusing on the small arms and the ammunition space. So in effect, differentiated from Arvind that uh, Mahindra Aerospace, we're more focused on creating uh, uh, products which have direct use with the military and the law enforcement sectors. Very little usage as far as the civilian sector is concerned. Now, <laughs> the moment I use those connotations, the first thing that will come to uh, clarity is that uh, you don't generally advertise small arms. I mean, find me one place in this world where you can actually put out a newspaper ad talking about your weapon systems. Of course, the only exception I can see to that is perhaps Syria and maybe Dara Adam Khel in Pakistan. But besides that, I can't find any place where you can actually advertise what you actually make. So the whole, I mean, the idea of marketing for a company like us 
which is operating in a military and law enforcement space and that too with weapon systems like small arms and ammunition is really about storytelling it is about how well you can actually talk engage with your user on one side which is actually the soldier or the jawan and on the other side how fruitfully you can engage with the procurement agencies which could be military and law enforcement and government agencies not just in india but outside of india storytelling does have a major influence in how we market ourselves in fact because of the fact that we precluded from putting in a lot of effort into traditional run of the mill advertising storytelling takes all the prominence so what is it that we talk about we talk about the origin of the company we talk about what we can actually deliver in terms of products we talk about the story of how those products evolve and we try and see how well we can engage in the course of that particular storytelling with the customer <clears throat> going forward how do i see this evolving well i do see that the storytelling angle is going to be taken to the next level we believe that the traditional means of marketing for us would continue to remain perplexing so the best option is to engage with customers through social media engage with the users the guys who actually are very uh, interested to learn understand the technical aspects of what we provide as products as weapons and ammunition uh, social media does have a very important role but at this point in time we are also exploring non traditional aspects like uh, podcasts hopefully in the next a uh, few months we do intend to kind of try and see if the podcast angle is something that we can example that we can set out as an example for uh, you know connecting with our, our our users and also with the guys who actually take critical decisions when it comes to procurements in india uh, there is a very important angle which i want to talk about as far as marketing for defense is concerned uh for so the idea of marketing a defense product is less about you know a swash buckling ad it is you know it, the the ad never makes uh, as much of an impact the idea is about communicating a message and for the most part it is about communicating a message of reliability stability being there when the times are there when the times are tough and self sustainability so if you've seen this focus around atmanirbhar bharat in the course of the last uh, a year or so uh you should be expecting to see a lot of indian defense companies including us trying to focus our attention on how well we can add to that particular angle and i guess that's pretty much where i want to kind of stop at this point in time i'll leave it to the rest great points and i think uh, there was a purpose why we wanted you to begin begin and i think you have very well fulfilled that vivek so you have brought in the first step of small arms and weapons and how your uh, marketing and pr is primarily around storytelling and podcasts etc super points let me just to fill out the perimeter of the discussion before i go to arvind who is uh, the leading figure in this uh, space uh, heading a very large organization and broad spectrum organization this is from uh, a study done by wolf va and lock from gstor this is just to broaden the perimeter i fully agree with what you have said vivek this study shows that how this industry uses these surrogate methods of advertising like what you call storytelling so they have looked at years of defense journal content and nine types of defense journals they have looked at first category is arm development procurement policy and weaponry second is military strategy third is military history military law and so on they have found that of all the nine strategies the first category accounts for 33% of the market and the rest is scattered among the others this is one point then they found in most of the top journals like armies and weapon asian De- uh, defense journal afric defense international defense review they idealize arms technology by suggesting the existence of some technological kind of beauty and inspiring a fascination with them and there is also in the granular part of the research they they come to uh, to descriptions 
like weapons were put against blue skies to convey romantic adventurism the editorial content of those journals is carrying a friend fro ideology kind of speaking of how the others in your neighborhood are militarizing the brand names it is noticed of most of the products advertised there are very uh, misnomerish so destructive weapon systems are called peacekeepers so kind of militarizing peace so they are saying that just exactly what you have said they are building on that way that symbol of precision and craftsmanship and huge technology and sophistication is what is demonstrated through the advertisements of these weapon systems not the carnage they bring about uh, the israeli kfir fighter plane has been advertised as the only lord above in the sky and below on the earth presented almost as a surrogate god so these these are all presented as sophisticated machines rather than implements of destruction so coming now to uh, the uh, now to arvind what is your view arvind where is <clears throat> what are your top thoughts on what has been discussed so far see pavan first of all thank you for uh, being uh, a participant in such an enlightened panel i am <clears throat> going to risk <clears throat> excuse me for my thought i am going to take the risk of actually digressing from the discussion uh, so to some extent if you call me a rebel that's fine but that's the only way we will encourage bit of a, a different context i am going to talk more from civilian space but but certain fundamental principles will always remain the same if i compare the two Uh, whether it is defense or a civilian product in aerospace or defense normally the advertising part is left to the oem it's the manufacturer who is typically advertising uh, for that matter the, the product he has to advertise um i am going to cater to that part of the conversation which says what are the marketing and pr strategies in the aerospace and leave the defense for the time being uh but i will still say that there are a lot of similarities when you are trying to demonstrate your product right <clears throat> you will never see a structural manufacturer or a subsystem manufacturer uh, being able to advertise because he doesn't have a choice he's a subsystem of a larger aircraft which is already advertised by the <clears throat> oem so it makes the job of marketing and PR for such a company a bit more complex. How do you get into and demonstrate your product? Because ninety nine percent of the time you are doing B two B, so which means your audience is very limited. And the the counter side to it is that when you talk B two B, the OEM themselves have a large audience available to them in terms of people who want to supply products to them. So we found, uh, uh, in terms of my experience and my study and my on education in the subject uh, we have to change the course of the way in which we do <clears throat> marketing and pr for example uh, as against the product the the most important thing which you will have to come up and convince them is to is to convince them that uh, is, to, is to convince them that you know you have a product and more importantly you are a company which can deliver in this subject which is very highly dominated by safety uh the first parameter which a customer looks for is are you in a position to deliver to that particular customer a product which is safe which is good on quality and you're going to be consistent <clears throat> and then you come across a scenario where you're competing with many good companies who are rated as good as you are and therefore your next subject is are you going to be a consistent performer uh if you look at last one year as an example a lot of companies who faced crisis during covid in some sense for some it became an opportunity because you could uh, deliver on time on quality and that's the largest test of acceptance you could give to a customer so the need to do marketing and need to do pr 
in a civilian aerospace is, is slightly complex and different than what you will typically see in the in the defense side. Secondly, there's a very big difference between defense and aerospace. Defense, to a great extent, is largely a compulsive expenditure. It is not as discretionary as as the civilian aerospace is. You know the the volumes dip and the production can drop down for some time and it will pick up after some time, but typically defense remains consistent because the national security takes precedence. So in my view, uh, a combination of a strategy where you have to be in a position to present your strengths to be a company which can deliver consistently on quality and cost uh, is going to be common to both the businesses. So as I said, I am going to focus more to bring an angle from the civilian aerospace side. And fortunately, last one year has given us a lot of lessons. How could we, how could we do advocacy and how could we do PR in an area where the whole civilian aerospace segment was going through turmoil? So, and and I'll open it to a counter view, if any, to all from other people. Then. No, no, I, I think I think that was a very good. Uh, addition to what we have discussed so far. I feel that the customer goes through a funnel of awareness, education, conversion. And uh, this will also answer one of the questions which had come up. That at a particular level, one may need even the OEM, uh, OEM manufacturer, you are the, you're right, he will advertise to the final buyer. And how, and this, that will be ne my next round of questions on tendering. How will the subsystem maker advertise to the OEM? What we call the defense prime. So there is a lot of work which has happened on content marketing, which you all are aware of that the subsystem manufacturer will look at where is the OEM supplier in the, in the funnel? Is he willing to buy my products? What is his stage? And then it may start from blogs, which is the top of the funnel, uh, creating awareness, social media, et cetera. Thereafter going to product features, uh, product, uh, uh, product videos, uh, buying guides, then finally going to spec sheets, etc. And this is the content marketing which will happen uh, for the subsystem manufacturer to advertise to the OEM. The large advertising which I was speaking of is of course, as you said, from the OEM to the final buyer. The other point which you brought about was safety and precision. And this ultimately translates to what you had earlier said, trust and credibility. And that also has to be built. And uh, it is truth well told, but if you, are, if you are really reliable and if you are timely and if you are precise, how can you differentially communicate this to the various audiences so that you stand above your competition? So this is where we are. I moved to Mahesh. Mahesh, you have been a stellar, a stellar force in the advertising industry. And how do you think that advertising of uh, defense and let us say aerospace also, how is it happening? And uh, if we can focus more on defense, we will be able to unveil some of the advertising or PR methods which these companies use, including exhibitions, merchandising, and so on. Your comments on this aspect, Mahesh, plus anything you'd like to add. Sure. Thanks, Pavan. Uh, uh, my greetings to all the uh, dozens and dozens of uh, attendees and uh, also to my, uh, my uh, uh, you know, very experienced panel. Uh, my name is Mahesh. I, run a fund that invests in aerospace companies and say, uh, space startups. So I, I have some experience, you know, uh, through that process. Also, I'm kind of a third generation defense product myself. So I have a little bit of experience in how products are, are marketed. Uh, 
how you market products is very different if you're a large company and if you're a startup. So I'll kind of give you a little bit of to and fro on that. But brand recognition, see, I mean, what is the basic process that you get selected either in uh, a defense bid or in an aerospace bid or even a civilian bid? Uh, many of these companies are process-driven companies or organizations are process-driven organizations. So the defense organizations are driven by a process. The process involves where well, somebody does an EOI, you know, uh, and after the EOI is done, then that's an expression of interest. Then there's an RFP that is that's a request for proposals that is put out, and then the proposals come in, and then there's a scoring pattern and so on and so forth. All right. Now the key thing here is to know of the expression of interest before the expression of interest is written. Right? Why? Because you want people. So essentially, if you're uh, you you want the team who is writing the expression of interest to understand the nature of the market, to make sure that the proposal is written in such a way that does not exclude you, all right? So for example, if let's say that hypothetically, a particular gizmo is needed with, uh, you know, minimum 10 kilogram weight and your stuff does as well, but it's nine kilograms, you need to make sure that it does not, it is not disqualified as, as a reason. So there is some amount of interaction that is needed at this point. So, there is some marketing that goes towards getting called in pre-UI. Things you have no idea what UI is going to come up unless you know people in the business. All right. So that's the first part. Uh, and then after that, uh, you know, the second part is, okay, once you come in and the UI comes and you present an RFP, people will sit back and say, who? I'm talking again from a startup point of view, who are these people? So you need to make sure that your website is working. There's enough news articles about you, that you are reasonably well represented on LinkedIn, that there are enough stories, because they need to know, am I dealing with a complete newbie or do these people know what they're talking about? Do they have the experience, all right? So you need to make sure you have enough names to show on your board of directors list and experience and so on. That, that digital presence is also advertising. In fact, more and more we're finding in at least our defense and aerospace companies that have invest, invested in, we have no idea where the leads are coming from, but they're coming in and people are saying they found us on the internet. So we need to make sure that there's a concerted effort. Uh, this perhaps may not have been true in the past, but it's certainly true currently, where, for example, we've got some random leads from African countries. We have not even reached out to them, but they were searching for us and they found us. And, and that's how you get into the process. Uh, I'm not talking from an OEM point of view. I'm talking from a small business or a startup that is actually has its own product. If you're a large business, it's a little different. You already have name recognition. You know, everybody knows you're a Boeing. Everybody knows you're a, you know, Airbus. So everybody knows you're a Bofors. Everybody knows you're an XYZ. All right. So for you, the issue, the issue is not to get onto the consideration list because you'll get off. Right. For you, the issue is to again at that point have the ability to highlight a particular feature that makes it core in the UI. Let's say that there is company X, which makes a jet fighter, and company Y that makes a jet fighter. Company X jet fighter is really good, but has like an operational range of 2,200 kilometers. Company Y has a jet fighter, which has an operational range of 2,600 kilometers. All right. Then company Y will work very hard to convince whoever it is to say that, yeah, you know, you need 2,400 kilometers as your minimum cutoff, because that's kind of the game of chess. You want to kind of knock the other guy out of the convention or, you know, make sure he scores your points and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, sometimes it is uncharitably called tender fixing, but it's not really. It's really influencing and understanding and making a powerful case why a particular specification is needed that the specifier in that defense organization may not be aware of. That's, again, uh, the communication. So once you've gone through that and et cetera, then typically what happens is, especially in a very large purchase. So you saw this, uh, for example, when the Rafael deal was on, when Mirage, you know, the salt was out there. Uh, the Indian newspapers are full of ads. The reason why was, it, you know, uh, they had understood that it had entered the public consultation process. A lot of people would be asking questions and they wanted to give air cover. People, you know, generally reading it, not just members of parliament, but Am Janta, the investigative press, everybody says, ha ha, TK, it's a good company. Well, Sahih Salaman, right? So to give air cover so that the transaction goes through. So at different points, you need to have different inputs that come in. Uh, these, like I said, to repeat again, there will be a mix of digital, uh, in-person videos, news articles, as well as print advertising that you do, apart from, of course, your presence on, uh, you know, YouTube, etc. So I want to say that it's a more complex process that happens out here. Now, 
but apart now there are other ways of getting into the consideration set if you're a small company and this is really to go to trade fair so if you're selling space or aerospace goods you get make sure you get listed on the portal which is about aerospace goods right and a few of them like alibaba's of the aerospace goods similarly you want to go to make if you're doing the space business you want to go and be there at uh, the you know iac which this year is in dubai if uh, if uh, covid doesn't hold out etc right uh, or you know so you want to be at the right trade fairs you want to make sure you're seen either in the national pavilion or whatever and you want to make sure that the the people from various countries come to you all right uh, for example one of our companies got invited to def expo in lucknow and it was a big boost because the prime minister of india visited the space the chief of air staff the chief of army staff the chief of naval staff they all in, you know came to the stall and more than that actually you know the defense procurement guys uh, they were more interested in saying oh these guys have visited your stall you got photographs now that's a good thing so it's not like necessarily the prime minister may have said anything to anybody or the or the chief of air staff may have said anything to anybody it was not even an air force product but the fact that you were seen in the company again scores brownie points so each of these uh, things you know you may think that attending a trade fair is not very useful but as it turns out a photograph from the trade fair can be more powerful than all the contacts you made at the trade fair of course in this particular case there were many uh, african and southeast asian and south american dignitaries that came and that was pretty useful at that point right so I, I, there's no one uh, queue out here so but broadly i wanted to say you have to understand each channel each funnel understand what you what it takes in each of these points and figure out what you do and don't worry what the others are doing right so each of these channels each of these markets has a different approach find works uh, what works better for you i hope that helps thank you for that absolutely absolutely mahesh in fact <coughs> sorry all the three panelists have fleshed it out so well vivek came from the uh, currently small company uh, perspective arvind came from very large company perspective and you built a ladder for each of these company types uh, as to how they can move forward in uh, this space and uh, before the expression of interest itself the engagement is important where you said that that 10 kg piece why it is not important and why 9 kg would do should be presented before hand only and from eoi to rfp to website social media footprint beautiful points then the large business also where you said that one one feature may have to be highlighted then a beautiful point which you made was regarding the sort air cover this air cover is doesn't only come in times of india india and economic times but also in financial times in washington post in in all the big newspapers of the country where where we uh, where the uh, seller needs to influence or give that air cover and uh, the you spoke about trade fairs and not only trade fairs but digital marketing uh, places also like the alibabas or the thomson register and so on uh, beautiful very good so coming to the second point coming to the second point uh, of the discussion uh, vivek how would you like to tell us uh, can you throw some more light on the eoi rfp website piece moving from the uh, from the subsystem manufacturers to the uh, uh, to the oems how you can what are the other ways through which you can crack that business Okay. Well, then, uh, because of the fact that uh, I may not be able to talk as a subsystem manufacturer, that that is something where Arvind really brings in substantial expertise. Uh, but for sure, as as a product manufacturer, because that's our entire focus, coming out with small arms and ammunition products, I can definitely give you my perspective. Uh, so, as as Mahesh did mention, right, you have a process of consultative uh, uh, discussions, and that happens. uh in the defense space at least and it's not just limited to india it's a global thing it happens prior to when the request for proposal or an rfq is floated now in general that is a point in time when companies have to work closely with the customer to kind of uh spread the word around what you have as a product it is also a certain sizing up the competition time when they're trying to figure out what exactly is it that the competition has 
the, the customer on the other side is also trying to say, fine, I've got A, which has got, you know, certain list of specifications. I've got B, which has got a different set of specifications. How do I justify what's more important for me? Now, <laughs> as I see it, and as I see how we are maturing in the course of the last few years, there once was a point in time, many years back, when Indian companies were uh, probably, you know, taking secondhand data and trying to, you know, sell the idea as to what you actually had as advantages or, uh, you know, attributes. Today, the difference is that we're trying to kind of develop uh, those attributes yourself. And that's because of the fact that there are more companies which are doing original research and development, trying to create their own products. And as you kind of go through with the creation of those products, your own understanding of what it is, the specifications are, and how do they matter to the customer, right? They are becoming more clear. But where we trying, where, where we as two plus difference trying to kind of make a difference is engaging with the customer much before trying to focus on what it is that he requires, right? That helps us because of the fact that we are in India, we're trying to kind of work very closely with the users and then communicate the same message as much as possible. If it doesn't stop at just, you know, one single uh, communication, you probably need to reiterate it many times over that this is what you have as attributes. And these are the attributes which will really matter for the customer because of the fact that he is going to face this kind of a circumstance or this kind of a mission criteria in the future. Now, that EUI stage is very, very important. I believe that the EUI stage is probably the most important of all because once the RFP in defense is out, you're probably kind of working on a process. And that process will have its, uh, you know, a definitive uh, series of steps. Um, as defense companies, what it is that we're trying to do at this point in time to make sure that, uh, you know, the communication is right, uh, A, um, clearly elucidate what you have as a point. There once was a point in time when we were kind of, you know, as I did mention, trying to kind of beat around the bush. Today, that doesn't work. You've got to be very clear about what you have as attributes, how those attributes help the customer, right? Second thing is focus on technology as much, because if you're in the defense space and you don't focus on the technology and the product attributes, you're nowhere, right? Uh, many a times it has been noticed, and the Western world does a beautiful job of this, that you don't really have something which is great as technology, but you still do a beautiful job of selling the technology. Right. And at times you find that the technological uh, edge is literally on paper, but it's really not there. Right. So uh, that, that's the second important part, learning how to sell the technological edge. Uh, the third important point, which I believe is going to be very, very important is education. Your customer is not going to be all understanding. The customer needs patience. He needs to be educated as well. In the defense space, there is substantial education which is happening. It is mutual. In fact, there are uh, you know, the government actually asks us questions as to what it is that you have as a product, why this is more important and why that's not more important. And, and we do that job on a regular basis. In fact, education is easily about 30% of my time as far as engagement with the customer is concerned. Um, on, on, on being a subsystem, I really can't really comment much. I think Arvind will have a better perspective on that. So before I come to Arvind and take his opinion on uh, these points, as well as on how, uh, as one of our uh, panelists has asked, how the markets for uh, the companies can be expanded. Let us say African countries, if they're already selling well in India, well accepted, uh, how can they go to uh, other, other geographies, which are also opening up for Indian weapons? We are seeing a growth of 500% in exports for Indian weapons. So that question I'll come to uh, uh, with to Arvind, uh, along with what he'd like to add on the tendering piece. But before that, let me just uh, get in uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Surinder Vedya, who, uh, who's the head of, uh, uh, who's the head of Godridge Appliance uh, Aerospaces. And um, is Surinder there or have we lost him again? I think we've lost him again. So let me go to, go to Arvind and uh, ask these two points, Arvind. First is, how, what would you like to add to what Mahesh has said and uh, what Vivek has added to it on the tendering piece? And tendering not only for the large 
equipment manufacturer, but also for the subsystem makers. And uh, then how companies can expand their markets geographically, Arvind. So Pavan, uh, as I said, you'll find me uh, more biased towards civilian aerospace. And the reason why I'm going to continue to come in back to civilian aerospace is because there are a lot of lessons which this particular part of the business presents. First of all, when you look at a typical uh, defense business process where there is a tendering system and you have an expression of interest, etc., 99% of the times you're free to tender, you know, you're free to bid. Uh, whether you get selected or not is a different issue, but there is no restriction that a newcomer cannot bid. Yeah, there could be certain specific expectations of certain products where they might say that size of the company has to be X, Y, Z. So, and if you compare it to civilian aerospace, I always say it's far more difficult. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, first of all, one has to understand <clears throat> if you want to enter a civilian aerospace or producing subsystems or any structural parts first of all you need to understand the depth of the market <clears throat> you need to know <clears throat> what do you want to manufacture okay and why do you want to manufacture number one and number two what is your differential going to be i mean why are you going to be different than other people so unfortunately in the civilian space the groundwork to be done much before you get eligible or get qualified to even bid for any expectation is a bit longer. So therefore do your homework correctly, understand which product segment do you want to operate in, what is your product differential. And then of course, you'll have to go through uh, traditional methods of presenting yourselves in the aero shows and participating in the events Many a times you might have to content yourself to go to a tier one and may not get an entry with an OEM directly and establish yourself as a player. Second thing is you need to have a very large amount of patience because it's not a process which is going to bring results day after tomorrow. You have to have patience and you have to be persistent with what you intend to produce and what you intend to make. And I come back to the third factor that irrespective of your quality of product, depending upon the country strategy of that particular OEM, you may have to work hard to be able to present your product. There are many times you may be producing wonderful product, but the OEM outsourcing strategy may not include that country as a country of preference. And therefore, how do you make a place for yourself to be able to get an entry into, into that space? And, but the best part of this story is eventually it is a very key business. If you get an entry and you're able to establish yourself, typically the relationship is very long term if you are delivering on quality and time and, 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 uh, and you're consistent with your performance and you are not an operator who's going to run away day after tomorrow. So as I said, as I compare the two extremes here, while in the defense space, you have a tendering business, you, you offer your product as a tender and you may or may not get selected. And of course, you'll have to work hard to present the quality of your product and, and sell it. But maybe your entry in that space is faster than an entry into the civilian aerospace and then the structure and the system side of it. So, uh, but the lessons more or less remain constant. It's the question of time. You have to have a product which makes sense. Therefore, your market study, your understanding of what will sell has to be your topmost priority. You just can't be another producer of another, another product which 25 other people are making in the in, in, in rest of the world. So you have to have a differential in your product. You have to have something unique in your product which takes you apart from other competitors. And, and the third factor is have a, patient, have a very patient attitude. It's not going to be a yeah, tomorrow's success. It's, it, it takes its own time to be successful, but the rewards are very good because once you have an entry and you're a consistent player, you are there for a long, long period of time. Great. So before I come to Surinder, let me tell uh, Mahesh as to what we would like him to chime in on. Uh, the role of MROs, the 
subsystem manufacturers as MROs. What Arvind is saying is uh, he's, he's crafted it very well to suit not only aerospace, but defense also. In both the spaces, there is the maintenance, repair, overall opportunity, which can go to the subsystem manufacturers also, it is going already. How can that opportunity be tapped? And any other points which will come up after Surinder chimes in, I will bring for you and Mahesh also the point as to how uh, these markets, which are now uh, uh, which are now very active in Africa, Middle East, etc., uh, can be also tapped by uh, Indian manufacturers. Uh, before that, let me go to Surinder. Hello, Surinder. Finally, uh, we can uh, we, uh, we 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 can see you. I know that you were stuck in yeah. bad Bombay uh, uh, Bombay uh, rains. It is a big pleasure having you with us. Uh, the audience already knows that you are the executive vice president and business head for Godridge Aerospace. Godridge was the first company in providing security in 1897. They made their first lock. It was a very reliable lock. That's and of course, it was domestic security. Now you have also uh, also moved on to uh, moved on to uh, inter-border security and Godridge Aerospace is uh, uh, making good strides. I would like to know from you your top of the mind uh, points which are coming right now on the topic or on the discussion which you have uh, heard so far before I go to Mahesh and I'll leave you in again in the next round. Surinder. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pawan, and uh, my apologies for not getting connected earlier. Uh, like you said, uh, I mean, our uh, NDUA started uh, 1897 securing uh, home. Today, we are trying to help the country to secure its own borders and secure the nation. And in this experience of last uh, 20, 25 years, I think we learned uh, two, three very important things uh, in this uh, uh, aviation or the defense business. Uh, first of all, it's a very, very highly regimented kind of a business where you need to really have very long gestation period to really think the ideas, to convert them into uh, some kind of a protos, try it out, do some ground test, uh, do yourselves uh, all those simulations and satisfy it on your uh, uh, computers before you can offer it to a user. And once you offer it to a user, it has to undergo extensive testing. And this entire process is so expensive that in case you want to really bring it back to another uh, uh, product or do any changes, uh, I don't think it is going to be so easy and so, uh, uh, I mean, economically affordable. That's why it is a very risky business. It has a lot of entry barriers. Those who are there in it, they really try to exploit the situation of them being there in this situation. And the important point is that there are very limited code standards and specifications. Whatever data has been generated by the OEMs as on date in the rest of the world or within India, it's kept for themselves. It is not something which is easily shareable. And that really creates a problem to really, how do we really do uh, marketing of our own products or how do you really get involved into uh, suggesting any changes to a government or help them in uh, making kind of a strategies for, I mean, currently we are hearing here in India, Atma Nirvar. I mean, banning 209 parts is very easy, but uh, now how to really produce them in India? Because only 60 to 70% of those parts are actually produced in India. Balance 30, 40% is coming from abroad. So just only banning it, is it going to solve our problem? Or do we have to really put in the fundamental research and really do all those 108 technologies which are vital for making these 209 parts to be successfully manufactured in India? So it, it has many different complications and those countries who are actually having a full control right from their raw materials to bought out to so their own standard specifications 
their own test facilities like high altitude test facilities and there are many test facilities and the test rigs which india doesn't have it how do we really qualify i know some of my friends from industries those who made the guns and rifles and uh, uh, bulletproof jackets but there was no provision in our laws to really test it out so to what extent are we really going to stretch ourselves to uh, whether we should stretch only to designing and making a product or should we stretch to suggesting what changes the law should really bring in the legal department should really work on to it so it's a multifold uh, approach which is required today for us in india to really be successful in aerospace and defense so i know there is a time constraint i have lost my initial opportunity to i will stop it here and uh, allow you to proceed further thank you for giving me this uh, last moment entry into this discussion no no i th i think it has been a very useful entry and you will get extra time for uh, because we are going to ask you about gem also the the most recent question which has come on the on the panel is regarding gm and i think you have raised already points uh, uh, which are very close to it you are saying that making will not happen just by banning imports for making to happen you have to really evaluate what all that technology needs to be made in india whether that ecosystem is present or not and how that can be facilitated secondly you are saying testing etc also is a problem and uh, uh, and testing facilities the range etc which you require in testing facilities has to be brought about you are also alluding perhaps to the fact that some other industries for example even the drone incapacitating industry the emr gun industry which sends electromagnetic streams to incapacitate drones that also will require uh, certain imports to at least have those things to practice on and lastly you have also hinted towards process and to that i will come in a moment after i have gone to mahesh and uh, our other esteemed uh, panelists uh, the gm process is a question which is being asked uh, please go through it and uh, let us have your answer when i come to you mahesh hey uh, <clears throat> when i i know you've asked me about subsystems and mros i am afraid i can't really help too much on the back because none of the companies i'm invested in is subsystems company Uh, in fact, uh, one of the interesting things we found was when we looked at the space sector, uh, there are only in the city of Hyderabad at least 500 companies that are providing components to ISRO. All right, uh, and we looked at them as potential investments, and then we figured that uh, they were too dependent on one customer or two customers to be able to do this. So we actually prefer to be investors in systems and and become primes as opposed to be, uh, it's better to be a small prime than a big sub. Was uh, our focus, uh, or you know, rightly or wrongly? Uh, but a little bit I can tell you about the MRO business is that uh, it is in some ways an overlooked part of the business, even for prime companies, uh, especially Indian prime companies. Uh, the overseas prime companies know because there is an offset, and you know, for every rupee of uh, defence imports, there is an X amount of offset. In fact, lots of negotiations we've done with Boeing and Airbus on what amount of offset can come to our companies and so on and so forth. Uh, but the indian companies need to be far more aware that there are similar offsets in african and other countries so you talk about how to go there and large part is to be able to say that you are equally embedded in that particular market to be able to say yes i can i can sell in ivory coast so i can sell in ghana or i can sell in mauritania or i can sell in burkina faso or drc congo or drc kinshasa and these are all countries that we have some levels of discussions with and here is a local collaborator and here is a local collaborator and here is a local collaborator governments like to know that See, they know they're going to spend a lot of money on defense. All right, they know that. They also know that, you know, it's a money-making industry. They want some of it to be able to come back to their own country. So I think that's one big part to be able to have local partners wherever you go to be able to create. Uh, and the way, place to meet these local partners is often the same exhibitions. All right. So that was one point I wanted. The second point I wanted to bring up was actually on on what um, Mr. Vijay said, and just taking it forward, you know. Uh, the rules of the land today are not keeping up with the reality of the land all right so for example we in the space business uh, still uh, have to perform according to 1998 space policy 
which basically means that uh, you know uh, there's we are not allowed to launch rockets everything else is legal it's funny that rocket companies got huge amounts of funding and only the rocketry launch part got legal a few months ago even though they got funding in the last few years the entire activity was was illegal in there but there are many more issues so let's say you're, you're selling a radio or you're selling a satellite radio you have to get uh, government permission to be able to broadcast on any particular you know frequency it is a nearly impossible process unless you figure some work around around it and so on so forth so a large part of this uh, we talked about advertising i'm going to bring it to the advocacy part the advocacy part is in finding champions who will work to stretch the rules or have them changed so that it can you, you can qualify for a bit so for instance if you want to be able to get a particular frequency to test your space based transmitters and receivers on and there is a certain log jam right now well you need to understand who to talk to at which organization so that they can go out and say that look this policy was written in 1995 or 1965 in some cases it, it's different in 2021 it needs to be changed similarly when it comes to it because i don't know if you're aware for example that uh, in the us there is a policy called ita which says that anything to do with space is an armament so even if i make a satellite with a tennis ball in it it is considered a nuclear weapon all right so there's an extraordinary amount of advocacy i have to do in the us to be able to import a satellite to be able to sell to india all right thankfully there are channels so a lot of this ad advocacy is in working with people now within the system there are people who want to hold on to the rules and within the system there are people who say look the rules have to be brought up to date at modern times a lot of advocacy is in going out and trying to persuade the people inside the system to become your advocates so that those rules can be relaxed in the case of their own need you know uh we are dealing with one particular defense customer we we said uh, uh you know he said i want a particular imaging to come to me i said uh, are you going to uh, download it yourself he said no no i want you to send me the image i said dude it's illegal said, what do you mean i said yeah it is legal for you to get that image from a foreign company but it is illegal for you to get it from an indian company this is really how can that be and yeah that's because you know at the time the rule was written it was not thought that the public sector could play any role in, in satellite imaging right so i'm saying uh, advocacy is really important not so much to promote your product as much as it is to remove the deterrents to the growth of your product the roadblocks are in you know can be removed with advocacy you so they you got to do two things so your advertising or your front foot is out there to start creating the need and the advocacy is to kind of take out the obstacles in a way these two together will actually help you overcome the problem sooner or you will keep finding like uh, i've been says you know it's a long painful process and after 3 months there will be another roadblock and after 6 months there will be another roadblock you've got to be able to use these tools of advertising and advocacy to be able to remove the roadblocks i hope that helps you excellent you have brought out a beautiful point and you have also touched the necessity to look at this space clinically advocacy may not be done as is often conjured when this word comes up only to push your envelope it might be it might be done to push out the injustices from the procurement system so uh, great point uh, regarding uh, the data elucidations point uh, which vivek you made that it is i mean uh, uh, arm suppliers or subsystem suppliers are known to not have many a time the data accurately there fully there the specs fully there the timing uh very clearly mentioned and the completeness of the data also you alluded to this fact that this should be there on the digit in the digital world maybe protected through passwords etc but it should be there so that your uh, buyers can look at it what else can subsystem manufacturers do to enhance the trust of customer and speed up his, his conversion and this is one point and the second point is you must have seen the the role of defense attaches in the last few years which has been quite admirable in promoting uh, weapons made in india and you have also seen 500% growth in exports uh what else can the government do because they often they say that the best advertiser for the weapons industry is the government 
because in every other space it has to be some kind of surrogate advertising but uh, the uh, the government can speak about its defense preparedness and at the same time uh, present truth well told uh, about the industry vivek so pavan i really want to talk about the second point which you did mention which is about how is that government changes and what is the what is the status quo when it comes to advocacy from indian companies so i'll i'll give an anecdote anecdotes actually work much better than just talking arbitrarily so about 4 years back i was actually trying to uh, you know work with the government trying to put forward a case for a certain uh, specific uh, you know opening up of licensing for a particular sector and why is it that the government's existing logic was not really applicable and the difference uh, you know four years back vis-a-vis -vis what it was the case about 10 or 15 years back is that today defense is being looked upon as an essential pillar of your industrial progress right it, it is no longer considered something oh you know it's, it's a dirty business it's not a business we should be in in fact the officer in concern said they quote you know if if we don't make it someone else is going to make it and if we don't sell it someone else is going to sell it right so the, the idea about selling defense should be ingrained into how we actually go about doing business in the course of the rest next decade or so and the other point that he did mention very clearly was if you guys are going to be looking at exports you know what i'll be far more keen and very very interested in pushing your case and that is one thing where i believe advocacy from the indian companies has really helped push the envelope especially in the defense space and especially when it comes to finished products products which we actually have put in a lot of effort on when it comes to organic research and development so uh, a few years back for for me to kind of connect with let's say the defense attache in uh, brazil or in the us would mean i have to write you know multiple channels and then finally he would come back and say hey can you please tell me what it is that you have as a product today i have a defense attache in another country is coming back and saying listen you know there is this particular requirement in my geography is there a possibility that you guys might have a product which is catering to that and if you do have a product which is catering to that how is it that i can try and help you guys out can i help you with translation services can i help you with identifying the people who might be able to get your product into the system can i help you with trials can i help you with getting no objection certificate and so on and so forth that is a key change and a lot of that's happened because of the focus on advocacy by the industry associations by companies themselves it has also happened because of the fact that there are more people who are willing to go out there and educate the government on what is needed that's the positive side of advocacy and let me tell you the other thing right advocacy has been an age old process the likes of a boeing and lockheed martin have been doing this for donkey's years right it is how the business in the us actually started picking up advocacy also does not mean that you paper over your failures in fact what advocacy would do is you try and see where it is that you failed and the next time when you succeed you're trying to highlight that particular success and go out into the world so what i would really want to see in in the form of advocacy from indian companies and definitely in terms of response from the indian government is to take the indian product and sell it to the rest of the world it's already happening so i can clearly tell you that the product that we made the tejas is seeing substantial traction when it comes to air forces in the neighborhood as also in southeast asia we would not have seen this if not for the kind of advocacy that indian companies have done including subsystem manufacturers onto the tejas right the government understands that this is great for gdp this is great for employment this is great for national image and it's at that point in time that the partnership between industry and government actually helps to put forward a project and i'm sure mahesh will actually be able to kind of talk more because some of those instances where you know uh, 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 foreign defense attaches defense attaches or indian defense attaches being able to help him out in the space business is going to be manifold in the coming years absolutely how well you have put it and you brought in to the spotlight a very important conversation which policy makers and the country have i think had the earlier concept was be the change you wish to see in the world this was a very good and spiritual concept however a new concept came coming from geopolitic reality which kind of said that the sheep can make as many resolutions in favor of vegetarianism as they want but till the wolf remains of a different opinion non vegetarianism will prevail in the world so basically 
the second concept which is driving the advocacy and the arms uh, industry today in india is saying that we are a moral and pacific country but that won't mean that we will not create arms because the world is moving in a particular manner if we are not ready to protect ourselves then tomorrow we cannot take relief in this spiritual doctrine that we should be the change which we wish to see in the world because if the more powerful forces do not accept that change then we will end up as slaves excellent point you are putting and vivek the other point which you are saying i fully agree with that and that has also been put by mahesh that in terms of uh, projecting the strength of the industry as well as connecting the industry with those attaches etc which uh, which uh, mahesh spoke of we have done very well there are surely areas of improvement to which i will come uh, uh, to surinder with regarding the gem as well as other points which are being raised here uh, but great uh, superb addition i now come to arvin for his uh, uh, last comments uh, and uh, thoughts on uh, the discussion so far arvin we can't hear you mute sir sorry i will rely on some part of what you and vivek have already covered but first of all uh, let's understand and acknowledge that government did a lot in last many years by bringing focus on aerospace and defense policies uh, significant defense procurement procedures were introduced to encourage industry indian industry to get an access offsets main objective was to create a compulsion for an oem to sell to procure product out of india today there are states who compete with each other in terms of uh, attracting companies who want to come to aerospace clusters to establish themselves then comes the second part of it what did the indian industry do so indian industry therefore responded i think significantly well you have engineering companies with well known names to they recognized as uh, significant uh, players in terms of the design technology of large companies around the world you have manufacturing companies who took advantage and established themselves to be world class manufacturers you have engineering and manufacturing organizations who demonstrated that i can give you an all included solution so in reality uh, the government did its part gave an access indian industry responded and when i talk of indian industry i'm conscious of saying that there are many companies at different sizes and scales who have made a difference in in terms of presenting themselves and getting an access to the market the only thing which i always caution that you cannot be lethargic and the second thing is you cannot expect that you always want the government to do everything for yourself they created an ecosystem they gave you an environment they gave you an entry now it's up to you how you deliver how you perform and how you can upgrade yourself in terms of getting more and more access of of the business out of the oem so i think we are in a wonderful shape right now india is recognized now as a country which can produce excellent engineering technology india is recognized as a country which has got one of the best aerospace manufacturers today most of us are sitting in the top 12 producers top 12 companies recognized by large oems to be one of the best producers of the products they are looking for uh, from an early stage where you could be just be producing a part according to uh, so deep down in the value chain you're now reaching a situation where you're asked to provide a solution people are recognizing that india is one unique country which can give them an engineering and production solution so companies come to us now and say can you give me a different way to do it together different way means can you help me engineer it better can you help me cut down the cost better so i think uh, we're living in a world where the government is doing its best to open up the segment making opportunities available government is listening to change in policies where required and now it's up to the indian industry to ensure they use the opportunity and they perform great i fully agree with you the government has done a lot maybe we can iron out some of the wrinkles 
uh, in the final paving of the road, which it has made. And on that note, I let me come to Surinder ji and ask him to give his final comments on the questions which are being asked. One is regarding gem, and the other is regarding overall export uh, facilitation, etc. Uh, Surinder. Yeah. So as far as gem is concerned, Mr. Pawan, it is uh, I think used for commonly available services and goods. It's not actually for a high technology portal where government intends to DGSND also is not really asking for a uh, very high technology product to be sourced from uh, the gem. So we must understand that gem is definitely a good initiative. It is going to bring the transparency which was being lacked, which is going to make uh, the inquiries available to everyone at the same moment rather than getting it posted or by other means uh, earlier days. Now it is all going to happen at the same time. So it's a very good portal. It is currently meant for only the, uh, the common uh, user goods as well as for the services. So it has its own restrictions and limitations as on date, but it can be further uh, expanded and grown to the very high technology. Now, just to give an overall comment on this, I think as I fully agree with Arvind and uh, your uh, opinion about the government has done everything whatever they can do it. I think thanks to the stability this government and the previous government got with the majority and it was not a coalition government, they could really push it. But one important factor, I mean, if any of these three, what you have put the marketing or the advocacy or the strategy can work provided, I think we can bring in one more change. Uh, I think our bureaucrats are bound to have a transfer every three years. Whereas any aerospace or a defense product cannot be really realized in three years or a project can really mature and get to a three years. And when the new person comes in, we have seen that we have to really start many times from zero. And it takes a very long time. Sometimes we go back to once again to drawing boards and even start redefining the specifications and the need and whether the negotiations have happened in the right way and whether the orders have been placed with the due diligence. So I think if we can bring in some kind of a stability by making some of the key critical, uh, the bureaucrats as uh, CEOs or like uh, general managers of that particular project and uh, their tenure should be at least 10 to 15 years. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I, I know that what I'm really asking can lead to somewhere else also. But I think we have tried all these other factors of transferring every bureaucrat every three years and then the kind of mess what we have created. So let's try the other side taking, knowingly taking a risk. So yeah. that is what I will just conclude. No, no, thank you very much. I think you are touching the area of administrative reforms and surely I fully agree with you. Tenures as well as the presence of technocrats, etc., has to be looked at very seriously so that people who are deciding are well acquainted with that area in which they are taking these wide vital decisions. On that note, let me say, it has been a great uh, interaction uh, with you all. So frank and so well informed about an area about which there is hardly much literature uh, available except for the expertise which uh, experts like you bring in. I would also like to thank the audience which has stayed with us almost in, in, uh, almost in uh, full numbers uh, since the time we started. And uh, even though we are 14 minutes ahead, uh, uh, more, more than scheduled time. So I'll pass uh, it on to Siddharth to conclude. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sirs. Uh, our leaders and I have taken home several nuggets from today's conversation. And I, and I really wish we had some more time. Uh, and thank you to our leaders in the audience for joining in. Uh, for the questions that may not have been addressed due to paucity of time, I will share the relevant ones with the leaders on the panel and request some of their time for it. Uh, we will also try to post these answers in the community app as well. Uh, along with our weekly webinars and our publication, we are taking these discussions and conversations on the exclusive community app curated for senior leaders across six sectors, which are uh, aerospace and defense, e-mobility, energy, real estate, logistics, and healthcare. So whether you would like to engage with us on our platform, 
leaders are invited to join the aerospace circle and also get access to the other allied circles which we're building. Uh, I've also shared uh, the, uh, the app link with some of you and we'll also be emailing you all shortly. So thank you very much, sirs, once again. It's been an absolute privilege and we look forward to having more such discussions in the future. And I will, I will also post on uh, the Blue Circle app the JSTOR uh, study, which everybody will enjoy reading, as well as uh, a very inspiring ad, which I've seen of the top 10 weapons from India. I'm sure it will also uh, make your heart swell with pride. Bye, everybody. Jai Hind. Thank you. Jai Hind. Okay. Thank you.